Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Electricity Canada's conversation series. The Electricity Canada, Electricity Canada is the national voice for sustainable electricity for its members and the customers they serve. My name is Farhan Mirza, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I'm broadcasting you from today is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. I'd also like to recognize Canada as the land of the First Peoples, Inuit and Métis. I'd like to pay homage to the Indigenous peoples past, present and future that continue to work, uh, educate and contribute to the strength of our country. I'd like to recognize that the land is shared through historic treaties, developed through contemporary treaties and one that continues to be unceded territory. Conversation series features presentations from Electricity Canada's corporate partners and the series will highlight a variety of Canadian and international solutions to current and future challenges faced by our industry. Working with our partners, these webinars have been developed to be of specific interest to those working in the electric utility space from generation through to the customer. For a list of upcoming sessions, please check out our website at electricity.ca. Before we get going today, uh, a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Our session today is scheduled to go from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Questions can be asked and we encourage you to do so throughout the session by typing them into the questions function on your screen. They will be asked at the end of the presentation. Finally, a brief survey will be sent out to webinar participants following the session today, and we very much appreciate your candid feedback as we look to improve this session moving forward, and as well as uh, go over any topics that you'd like to have included in the future. Please keep an eye out for future webinars and events through our monthly newsletter, Current Affairs. With over 6,000 subscribers, Current Affairs is the place to go for Canadian industry news as we connect the national value chain from generation through to the customer. If you'd like to receive Current Affairs, you can subscribe to this free publication by going to our website again at electricity.ca. Today on the conversation series, we'd like to welcome Over IT, who will be talking to us today about the new era of grid modernization, enabling the workforce with a single plane, pane of glass. In recent years, utilities have entered a new phase of grid modernization to combat extreme weather events, mitigate the rising costs of global energy resources, and protect the grid from physical and cyber attacks. However, the adoption of cutting edge technologies has also increased the complexity of job execution. As a result, the modernization of field workforce in tandem with the grid modernization has become equally important. In today's session, Over IT will showcase how utilities can achieve modernization by providing a single pane of glass to maximize situational awareness, enabling the field workforce with an AR VR based platform for safer and faster job completion and connecting new employees and retired workforce on a virtual collaboration platform to promote knowledge sharing. Our presenter today from Over IT is Kim Elliott, Director of Solution Engineering. Elliott, I'd like to welcome you to the conversation series. We'll now turn the webinar over to you. Thank you very much, Farhan, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, no matter where you're, where you're joining. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. So just a very brief introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Elliot Kim, Director of Solution Engineering at OverIT. And uh, uh, one sentence that I would love to kind of summarize myself is that I'm a utilities and field workforce management enthusiast slash lover. So I really love working with uh, all the electric and utility customers in the past uh, seven to eight years. Uh, you know, first of all, thank you for everything that you do. I truly believe that utility and electricity um, industry is really the industry that every other industry depends on, right? So, you know, I, I, nothing is possible with you guys. So thank you for your time and thank you for all you do uh, in general. Uh, you know, most recently I've worked with San Diego Gas and Electric here at OverIT, helping them with their field workforce modernization projects uh, for the past few years uh, with companies such as Salesforce, Click Software, and Oracle, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, I've also worked with various utilities in North America, such as Ambridge, Hydro Quebec, SAS Power, and SPI, and so on and so forth. So uh, today we'll be uh, mostly focused on the field, field workforce modernization uh, topic. Uh, but before we uh, get into that, just like Farhan said, I, I just want to situate ourselves and talk a little bit about the challenges uh, that modern day utilities are uh, faced with. I'm sure many of you uh, attendees are very familiar with, but you know, number one, the climate change and extreme weather. I mean, just this past weekend, where I'm based in Los Angeles, California, 
we had our first tropical storm in uh, the uh, past 84 years, right? And on top of all of that, when we were having the storm, we also had an earthquake on the same day. So uh, the mother nature is really not being that kind to us. The extreme weather and climate change is real. Uh, it is affecting uh, every day of, you know, North American, uh, um, you know, residents and all around the globe as well. Uh, but on top of that, uh, North America and, you know, Europe as well is struggling with the heat waves and unprecedented uh, the temperature hikes, right, that certain parts of North America is feeling, I believe, up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is really uh, unheard of. So the, 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 the need for stable power source, the need for stable grid, uh, is you know higher than ever, but also on top of that, we need to battle these storms and uh, uh, unplanned outages. And you know, on top of all that, what's really happening in the past year or so is the global rising cost and eco economical and financial impact that our modern day utility uh, needs to battle with, right? So uh, as the you know as we're trying to solve these problems, as we're trying to uh, battle these rising costs. The rates tend to go high, and for the most part, we uh, were able to successfully keep the bills low, at least, uh, for our customers with various programs. But just this past year or so, the bills are getting high too, right? So it's not just that utility, it's costing us more to hire people, costing us more to buy materials, to harden our assets, but the impact is also getting trickled down to our customers too, So which is a lot of them are um, you know, either forced to not turn the AC or uh, they're forced to look at the cheaper alternatives as well, right? So they need to uh, look at different options and different programs uh, than you know, uh, what they used to be able to do uh, just a few years. And all of that uh, is combined with the increased physical and cyber attacks, as you guys are all familiar with. Uh, the recent study shows that just this past year, 2022, the, the physical attack against our grid in North America has increased by 77%. So uh, we've always talked about these problems, about climate change, extreme weather, and cyber attacks and physical attacks. But just this past few years, uh, it really does show that these problems have accelerated uh, for us. So. Uh, as always, uh, you know, as an industry and as human race, we've always turned into uh, innovation and new solutions to combat and battle these challenges uh, that we cannot uh, necessarily control over. Um, and that has resulted in what we call the new era of green modernization, right? So green modernization is a project that's been going on for the past uh, two or three decades. But just these recent years, we were turning more and more into, we really accelerated the adoption and implementation of renewables and battery storage for, uh, to combat the unplanned outages and uh, climate changes, as well as our customers are leaning more and more towards to electric vehicles and uh, distributed energy resources uh, for cheaper and more environmental options. And our grid also needs to be ready for that, right? It has to be compatible for those changing behaviors of our customers. And, and as we all know, to combat all these challenges, um, the advanced metering 2.0, the new sets of AMIs are coming in. The life cycle of AMIs, as we all know, is about 20 years. And then the first batch of AMIs got really implemented around early 2000. So we're really at the cusp of the new life cycle, the new generations of AMIs coming in. And, you know, we're really capitalizing the opportunity to combat all these uh, battles of climate change and attacks and really needing the real time information with AMI 2.0 and cutting edge technology. So, uh, as you know, to summarize, we have all these accelerated challenges which have resulted in the new era of grid modernization, which some people like to call it uh, grid modernization 2.0. Which, is, which really denotes a accelerated growth and accelerated implementation of these cutting technologies. But you know, this is all good. This is really the right path and truly a path that we need to all take. But you know, ultimately what this new era of grid modernization means to our field technicians, to our field workforce, is that not only that the work volume itself is getting more and more, it's getting higher, but the nature of the work itself is getting more complex, right? There are more complex field work. 
installing and servicing a meter is no longer the same as you know 10 or five years ago now these meters are practically computers right or servicing an asset in a substation is totally different game with all the iot devices and sensors uh, and then connected grid projects uh, compared to what it used to be uh, just a few years back. So uh, we are dealing with uh, more complex work. The nature work of, of the work is getting more complex. And to top it all that, about 50% of our field workers are set to retire in the next five to 10 years, uh, you know, which is really scary if you think about thinking about the global uh, workforce shortage. So if you kind of look at it as a graph, our work is getting more and more in terms of volume. There's more work, but also it's getting more complex. So work graph is going up, 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 up. But then our workforce, field workforce is getting more and more inexperienced because of the retiring workforce, uh, global workforce shortage. Yet the technology and the tools that we enable and empower our field workforce with has kind of plateaued in the past few years. So. Uh, what we wanted to talk about is exactly how we want to address this, address this problem uh, with the concept called field workforce modernization. So, you know, field workforce modernization, enabling our field workforce cannot be a second thought anymore, right? It, you know, we cannot say, okay, grid modernization 2.0 is our number one priority, field workforce modernization comes next. No, you know, the field workforce modernization has to be a very important pillar. It has to be a very important facet that's incorporated into our grid modernization projects uh, if we really want the successful outcome out of this uh, grid modernization 2.0. So uh, that's what we wanna really focus on today on how we can achieve uh, the field workforce modernization along with our grid modernization projects. And the three key factors, the three key concepts that I want to focus on today is number one, a single pane of glass, which I'll explain what that means uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and then number two, augmented reality and virtual reality based execution and training for our newer workforce. And then we're gonna uh, conclude our session with uh, the use cases of remote and virtual collaboration today. Uh, and as we go through, please feel free to put in your uh, questions or thoughts and comments into the chat, uh, which once again, we'll address towards the end of the webinar. So with that, I'm gonna go into the first concept called single pane of glass. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it's just practically a notion that uh, providing the unified visibility of all the information that we need from the field workforce perspective into a single application. So whether that's a work order information, whether that's the asset they need to service, the resources around the asset, such as their field technicians, uh, nearby colleagues or uh, vehicles and et cetera, as well as customer information too, for those who uh, of field workforce who is more customer facing. So providing all that information into a single visibility so that we can really modernize the work experience for our field technician. That, that's at the end of all what single pane of glass is all about. And so, you know, why do we wanna do it? What, you know, what, why does it mean to provide a single pane of glass? Uh, I mean, the truth of the fact is that field workforce modernization, uh, it really means that aligning your field workforce's work experience, their execution experience, as aligned as possible with their day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day experience of how they interact with their uh, mobile applications and maps and so on and so forth. So, uh, I mean, just, just you, uh, think about the last time that you used uh, Google Maps or any kind of map application on your phone to get to a new restaurant that you're meeting up with your family members or friends. Uh, if you think about that experience, as you recall, you know, it, the Google Maps on your phone no longer just provides the directions to how to get to the restaurant or the ETA, but it also provides all the reviews about the restaurant and provides the menu of the restaurant, the photos, and all the uh, peripheral information that you may need about you know what it means to get to that restaurant, right? So it's not just about uh, you know the basic information of uh, directions and so on and so forth. And as it does that, it keeps you in that app. You don't have to go switch back and forth between multiple applications to get all the information. So if that's what our field workforce, our field technicians are experiencing in their day to day uh, using their personal application, why not provide the same experience and modernize their work setting 
uh, with single pane of glass by providing work and asset and resource information all together uh, into the same platform. And uh, a recent study also shows that uh, about 59 minutes, 59 minutes are lost per day, per person, per worker, uh, just trying to navigate between different applications and trying to get the right information uh, for their work, right? So think about the benefit of not just modernizing and then allowing your workers uh, to feel modernized uh, in their work experience, but the, the benefit of, of returning back the 59 minutes of having to go back and forth between multiple applications into just having to be in the uh, single application, uh, it also makes them uh, be able to work a lot more efficient and get more work done uh, as we combat with this uh, workforce modernization projects. And you know, on top of all this unified visibility of all the work, the number one information that our field technicians probably need as they go out and get their jobs done uh, is the geospatial information, right? The GIS information uh, that, uh, so that they can have the maximum situational awareness. So that is a critical piece of the information that they need uh, for a single pane of glass. And you know, just to pause and uh, take a note here, the, sometimes the best GIS strategy has nothing to do with the actual GIS software they're using or actual mobile application that you're using. It sometimes always comes down to the processes uh, and practices uh, that you uh, that you want to provide to your field technician. So uh, work backwards from your field workforce experience. Think about how you want to modernize how they consume and interact with the GIS information, right? So, uh, you know, think about as our field technicians are going online to offline, you know, how do you want that GIS experience to feel like for our technician? And, you know, sometimes as they're getting uh, pulled out from their usual area, usual service area to another district or another city uh, for unplanned outages or storm situation, Think about how you want to make sure that your technician has the right GIS package downloaded for offline usage uh, as they're um, you know, uh, getting dispatched to, uh, out to those work. So you know, start from there and then sit together with your engineering team, GIS team, and field technician team to talk about, okay, how do we want to segment our GIS layers? How do we want to layer our GIS layer into most critical pieces? Uh, then maybe like good to have information, then maybe to something that they don't usually need. So by being able to layer and segment your GIS packages in a more optimal way, uh, that can really help with the modernization of field workforce experience when it comes to single pane of glass. Uh, and with that being said, the last component of this single pane of glass uh, is that really capitalizing upon the real-time data and updates now that we can get from our grid, right? So a lot of real-time information coming from IoT devices and sensors, different inspection mechanisms. On top of that, everything that we have, such as automatic switch, SCADA, OMS, and CIS, the data is the easy part right now. There's a lot of uh, real-time data that's getting flown in uh, to our organization. But instead of just using that for our operational analytics for back office operations team, why not give that data in the hands of our field technicians and field workforce as well? As the recent study shows that you know the field technicians uh, with the real time data uh, in their hands uh, get to work not just safer, but also it turns out to be that uh, they can provide more uh, profitable outcome. Uh, from the field workforce uh, perspective as they can get the jobs done more accurately, uh, a lot more safely, as well as more efficiently. So those are the three components of a single pane of glass when it comes to achieving field workforce modernization. Once again, the whole ultimate goal is so that our field workforce experience gets much easier, they can get the jobs done much faster, uh, faster uh, as well as uh, more importantly, a uh, safer environment uh, that they can put in, put themselves into with a single pane of glass. So uh, with that, the second component of a field workforce modernization project is really around the augmented reality and virtual reality based execution and training on top of uh, on, on top of all the uh, kind of uh, new technologies around artificial intelligence and computer vision as well. So 
Uh, and one use case of how we can modernize our field workforce experience is providing the augmented reality-based work procedure. So what that is, is that uh, think about a handheld device like a tablet or a phone, and then our field techs can utilize the device camera and point at the asset or point at the screen that they're working with. And then the camera, the, the, the system that they're using, the solution that they're using can recognize the asset and then overlay augmented reality-based annotations and animations and pointers uh, exactly pointing to where to look at, which buttons to click, which wires to look at, and et cetera, as they go through the work so that it gets a lot easier and safer for our field technician to execute the work. So uh, it's almost like providing a one-on-one -on -one coach, like the virtual supervisor almost always being there for our field technician as, gave, as, go, as they uh, go through the job for various types of assets, even for the assets that they may not be so familiar with. So this can come in really critically for our um, younger workforce, as well as any new types of the devices uh, that you may be putting in uh, for uh, as a part of grid uh, modernization projects. This can come in really handy with the adoption and then uh, increasing the service quality uh, of that work on top of modernizing our workforce experience. And uh, kind of similar to this idea, the kind of extension of this uh, guided procedure using augmented reality is utilizing what we call uh, computer vision. So uh, when our field technician is uh, having to collect the data back, right? So let's say they have to put down certain uh, asset code or read certain data from the field asset or whatever that they're working on, instead of asking them to manually put in the work through their keyboard or using pen and paper, uh, but rather just simply take a photo of the asset and then allow the solution to automatically parse out, just automatically recognize what is the relevant information from the photo and automatically take that in and record the data for the um, data collection purposes. So uh, this can really help with uh, really sustaining the safer environment because the technicians are not so distracted around having to worry about typos, but also the quality of the data collection can go up significantly. So from the case studies that we have seen, uh, one of uh, over IT customers have implemented something similar using computer vision based data collection. And then the margin of error for the data collection has decreased down to 0.01%. So that's every 10,000 data field that our field technician needs to collect is only one error out of it. Of course, the uh, goal is to uh, bring it down to 0%, but 0.01% is a pretty good benchmark uh, that we can hit on and then really can help with our field workforce feeling modernized as they go through the work, just having to take a photo of the asset for data collection rather than being distracted by the fact that they need to collect the data manually on their own. And the last component that I want to talk about here around augmented and virtual reality execution and training is really utilizing the virtual environment uh, for the enablement of our field technicians. So as we talked about, uh, the, we need to replace our retiring workforce in the, past, uh, in the next five to 10 years, but the new generation of the workforce that's going to come in uh, is more familiar with the concept of remote work, right? So, you know, they are more uh, impacted, heavily impacted by the COVID era, uh, the, the new workforce that's going to come in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and then they will be more familiar with the virtual setting and remote setting of the trainings and environment and taking classes uh, from school. So uh, providing the similar experience to our workforce, um, you know, is a modernization that we can achieve. But on top of that, this can also help from the utilities perspective that we can really provide the trainings that's sometimes pretty costly uh, to mimic in real life. So things like uh, outages or storms or dangerous situations like um, you know, assets going up and uh, maybe potential explosion hazard and et cetera, that if you wanna actually train somebody that in real life, this could be not only dangerous, but costly and time consuming in the way, but instead of uh, doing that in real life by creating a virtual environment that we can expose our workforce around that, uh, number one, we can at least have our, uh, you know, the, the field workforce to be more familiar with what a potential hazard and high risk activity situation may look like. 
but they can also cut down the cost. And by digitalizing all these enablement sessions, we can collect the data back, as you can see on the video, and then analyze the performance of our enablement, uh, analyze the effectiveness of our training, and then pinpoint what are some of the areas that our newer workforce uh, could struggle with, right? And then improve our enablement in that way. So it not only helps with our, um, you know, just workforce experience perspective, but also it can help with reducing down the cost and then coming up with more effective training procedures and programs from the utilities perspective. And, you know, to be honest, as I work with a lot of our utility customers, as I talk about these virtual and augmented reality execution and training sessions, the, usually the first sentiment or feedback that we get is that, you know, either we've tried it, but adoption wasn't that great, people are still struggling with the technology, or they think that this is too futuristic, right? They're not ready yet. Uh, you know, this is, um, you know, they do not have the capacity to go to their virtual world yet. And, you know, to a part, I do agree that, you know, the virtual world, the virtual reality adoption has not been as accelerated as we expected uh, as an industry. But think about the innovations um, that's happened in the past few decades, how it's been always led by better hardware, right? So even think about 10 years ago, it was really hard for us to imagine moving away from pen and paper or tough book based uh, data uh, data collection, right? So um, the, 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 the thought of using a handheld device, allowing our field technician to collect the um, data without keyboards, without pencil, uh, you know, and but just purely based on their fingers as well as just voice recognition, uh, was something that was hard to imagine if you if you think back in five to ten years. But due to the acceleration of innovation in hardware space, uh, you know, for instance, Apple coming up with tablets that was really responsive, that was really easier to use, and then it led to a mass adaption from the consumer market, right? So it totally changed how we as human beings on a day-to-day -day consume and interact with data, right? So we use iPads and iPhones now to look up news, watch YouTube videos, and go on social media, and et cetera. So because we are so familiar with that technology and platform on our day-to-day -day as a consumers, adaption of that technology into our field of workforce uh, was rather easy, right? You know, when we presented tablets to our field technicians, they were not like, what is this? I've never seen this before, right? Uh, they, they were already familiar with what to do, how to interact with it. And as we know, the Apple is coming up with their new virtual reality glasses uh, that has addressed a lot of that addresses a lot of um, complaints and problems that we've talked about in the virtual world. Uh, number one thing: the device being not so intuitive and device being too heavy. Um, so I anticipate, and a lot of people anticipate that this new hardware innovation of Apple Vision Pro is going to change the way that we as consumers are going to uh, interact with the data, right? So we're going to be now interacting with the data, consuming data, um, and you know, just being connected to the data in a different way using uh, virtual reality glasses such as Apple Vision Pro. Thus, the change management, the adoption of the technology into our newer field workforce uh, will be a lot easier. In fact, we may even get asked by the field technicians in the five to 10 year time frame that they want more virtual reality and augmented reality based way of data collection, field execution and enablement. So uh, you know, this is something to think about, right? The change management and then the hard work of incorporating how we are familiarized, uh, how we familiarize ourselves with these platforms will be done in the consumer perspective. So uh, thinking about how we can get ahead of the curve and then really start incorporating that AR and VR-based execution and training into our field workforce modernization project uh, will be the key uh, for uh, getting ahead of the game and modernizing our experience uh, in the future. So once again, uh, the whole benefits around the AR and VR-based execution, we can get help our field techs get the jobs done easier and faster in a lot smarter fashion as well. So uh, to kind of wrap our ideas around the field workforce modernization, the last concept, the last pillar that I want to talk about today uh, is the uh, rem uh, remote and virtual collaboration feature. So uh, this is a, a classic example of 
the change management and adoption of technology already being done, already being performed in the consumer market. And then now we can incorporate that uh, into our day-to-day -day field workforce work setting, the actual uh, you know work setting and execution setting. So I'm sure every single field technicians out there by now has probably uh, done a remote or virtual session uh, with somebody using some kind of technology. So it's it could be joining a webinar like this, you and me, or it could be just talking to a face, uh, you know, a, a, a family or friends through FaceTime during COVID era, or uh, jumping on a Zoom call for a tailboard meeting and et cetera. So that's been already done. People are familiar with the concept of remote and virtual collaboration. So now we can incorporate that idea into field workforce modernization. So a, a use case is that we can connect now new and retired field workers. So uh, you know this is a use case that as our uh, really subject matter experts and those industry veterans who has worked out in the field for the past 20, 30, 40 years are retiring, uh, instead of just losing them uh, you know, right away, but we can go ahead and slowly refocus them to be more of a uh, remote helper. So as our uh, field workers are getting out there and then running into issues and problems, they can be connected with our retired field workers who could be working part-time or to the minimum basis that, but they can be online to help uh, with our uh, field workforce to uh, get them, give them the guidance that they need to get the jobs done safer and easier fashion. Uh, and another use case, of course, with the back office subject matter experts and field workers. So even if our field workers run into an asset or problems that they have not seen before, that they have not been trained before, instead of just having to incomplete the work and, and suspend the work and then come back later to it, they can tap into the resources in remote time and be more comfortable with getting guided uh, through remote collaboration. And uh, one thing that I want to note is that you know the one difference between a day-to-day -day consumers how they do remote collaboration through Microsoft Teams or webinars or uh, FaceTime and et cetera versus how our field workers need to collaborate. Uh, the key difference is that the online and offline, the bandwidth, right? So a lot of times our field workers are working in a remote area uh, or areas uh, where the internet connection is not so great, such as basements and uh, substations and undergrounds and, uh, and et cetera. So uh, as you go ahead and try to incorporate this remote and virtual collaboration session, think about how you can go ahead and analyze your remote setting. So what is the uh, percentage of the time that our field workers are out there doing work in a remote area where there's not a great uh, uh, internet connection? How do we want to modernize that experience, right? So uh, it really depends on, the answer depends on where you're at as an industry or at where you're at as an organization. I know that some of our customers are laying down, um, you know, internal uh, communication channels like internal fiber optic cable to uh, uh, increase the connectivity across their remote areas, or uh, you can do something as simple as the bandwidth analysis, right? So what is the minimum bandwidth that we sometimes that we get in those uh, remote area and make sure that any kind of remote and virtual collaboration platforms that we implement can actually perform with that uh, really low bandwidth uh, that we may have to work with in those real areas, right? So it always comes down to looking at and analyzing your current situation and processes and how we can uh, bridge the gap between where we wanna be to the end of the field workforce modernization via the technology, not the other way around, not like, you know, let's go ahead and put the remote and virtual collaboration platform in there and then, you know, for low bandwidth or low internet connectivity sessions, allow the field technicians to kind of work around or deal with it. That that's actually going to result in a suboptimal uh, modernization uh, modernization effect uh, of our field workers. So always start from the analysis and current situation processes, uh, then work your back work your way back to technology and platforms. And so with that, the last component of this remote and virtual collaboration session is actually connecting your customers with your field technicians and service reps. So, uh, you know, everybody, as we talked about, just around the globe is more familiar with the remote collaboration idea uh, after COVID than it was before. So 
you know, customers we've seen are being more and more susceptible. Like they're more accepting the fact that they may need to get help or it may be helpful for them to get help uh, via uh, virtual collaboration and remote collaboration sessions. So as you think about field workforce, workforce modernization journey, also thinking about how we can incorporate our customers and our uh, consumers into that journey will be also the key of additional success of this whole project. So once again, utilizing the remote collaboration and virtual collaboration can lead to our field technicians uh, experience a lot easier and faster execution, but also happier too, right? They, they can always rely on the uh, remote experts whenever they get into trouble. They don't have to feel so left alone uh, as they go through the uh, work execution out in the field. So um, to summarize all that, once again, the new uh, era of green modernization has resulted in the more complex work and just simply more volume, higher volume of work uh, yet we are losing a lot of our experienced field workers. Um, so, uh, you know, we need to go ahead and empower and enable our new workforce and workforce in general. So uh, in order to do that, achieving the field workforce modernization uh, will give our workforce more effectiveness, a better quality of work, and most importantly, of course, uh, a lot safer and a lot compliant environment uh, that they can work out of. So. In conclusion, we've talked about three different ways or three combined ways of uh, stepping one step towards to the field workforce modernization, which is utilizing single pane of glass as well as AR and VR based execution and training, and then remote and virtual collaboration between new and retired workforce, between the back office subject matter experts and field services uh, representatives, as well as our customers and our utility internal employees, such as service reps and field techs. So with that being said, thank you so much for your time today and thank you so much for your attention. I'll turn it over to Farhan uh, to open up the uh, Q&A session. Excellent, thank you very much, Elliot. That was a great presentation. I appreciate you taking us through all of that. Uh, to our audience, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, if you're um, able to type in any questions, uh, please enter them into the questions field in our, on the uh, taskbar, and I'll ask them of Elliot as they come in. Um, to start things off, Elliot, perhaps um, we can we can go over um, uh, some questions that we had here. Uh, what's your recommendation of getting started with AR VR based on uh, base procedures if we don't have any of our assets in digital format yet? No, that's a great wow. question. For me. So. Um, you know, there are a lot of utilities who do not have these assets digitized yet, right? Or they don't have in a, you know, VR session or uh, in, in, a, in a like a digital twin uh, format, as we call it, to put them into a augmented reality uh, annotations or put them into a virtual setting for training. So uh, my answer is always start from analysis of where you're uh, where you're at. So. Uh, you don't have to have all the assets digitized for that AR, VR based execution and training to be effective. So what I usually recommend is that go through the past history of your work and training, right? And then just identify maybe top three asset types or top three work order types that your field technician tends to struggle the most with, right? And it could be the, the newest set of AMI that they were asked to implement and install. They just simply not familiar with the new type of devices that they have to work at, thus maybe the success rate of the implementation of that AMI to customer sites are lower than you know, previous versions of Meter, for instance, right? So you can start from there. As you do the analysis, you, you'll be able to kind of identify and pinpoint the bottleneck of your organization, and then just turn that one asset into a AR VR asset. So, you know, you can always come and work with vendors like over IT to help you with turning that into a digitized asset. Um, a lot of times you may already actually have that asset somewhere in your engineering group or in your uh, GIS or, uh, you know, some kind of uh, groups that may do like a building information management and et cetera. So you can ask them whether internally, you, whether you already have a digitized format of the asset or just hire or contract a graphic designer uh, who can turn those assets into 3D. Um, usually it takes about a week or two to turn one asset into a consumable digitized format. So it's really not that bad. So start from the process and analysis and then turn and then identify where do we want to start? Which asset do we want to start? And then go from there. 
uh, instead of go big bang of like, okay, here are the hundred types of uh, arresters and transformers they would like to turn into digital asset. And then let's just do a big bang rollout. Actually the other way around of starting small uh, may prove to be a lot more effective and easier uh, for your organization to get started with your AR VR journey. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, the question here, um, Elliot, how do we handle various offline scenarios for all the things that you talked about, especially around the GIS and, and remote collaboration? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I think those are the two most areas that offline comes in a lot. That, you know, for GIS, you know, when you're online, when you're connected, it's usually not a problem, but depending on how large the area it is that you're servicing, it's just it's not practical uh, for us to turn all that area into a GIS packet uh, and then have field technicians have them downloaded for offline usage. It could go up to, I've seen uh, up to 400 gigabytes of worth of data that they need to carry for offline GIS, which, you know, uh, it's, it's not feasible per se. It's not a good modernized experience for your field technician. So once again, starting from your processes of when it comes to GIS, survey your field techs and survey your engineering team, survey your operational team and say, what is the layer? What is the GIS layer that's most critical for your field technicians for various situations, for an outage, right? Or for an inspection, uh, for a remote work, um, you know, generation site, uh, troubleshooting, so on and so forth. And then you just kind of go ahead and segment different layers for different situations. Now you can go ahead and really decrease down the size limit, the size of the GIS packets that you need to communicate with your field technician. So starting from there and then see what is the most critical um, layer and then how do we wanna segment uh, our areas differently uh, for our field technicians. And then the next step will be communication side of it, right? So let's say for on, you work out of Ottawa a lot, but then for a storm or for different situation, now you're taking off from your usual district to another district, you're more likely to not have the GIS packet that you need, uh, right? And then, you know, you get to the on-site and then you're remote just to realize that you don't have the right GIS packets. And, you know, that's really the situation that we don't want our field workers to be in. So always communicating that as we move our work order from back office to the hands of field technician, communicate the, the need of GIS packets along with it, right? So saying that, you're now going to this area, which is not your usual work area. So you need to download GIS packet, you know, 201 from our repository before you go online, right? So before you go offline. So those kind of communication strategy and then really talking a lot to your field work, field workers and see what is the layer that is critical uh, is the key to success on that one. Uh, to answer the second part of the question, remote collaboration, you know, like we talked about during the uh, presentation, it's really doing the low bandwidth analysis, right? That what is usually the bandwidth limit that's provided in a um, setting that our field technicians are working remotely. So, I mean, to top it with, if it's completely offline, there's no remote collaboration, right? You won't be able to talk to anybody, but there are situations that's really low connectivity and then do the analysis of like, so what is that connectivity? Is that 10 kilobytes? Uh, you know, per uh, per second, or is it 10 megabytes, right? So you can do that analysis of your remote area and then design your solution to be able to be compatible with that rather than, you know, let's buy a remote collaboration system and then see whether, you know, our field technician can utilize it in the remote area, right? So kind of reversing the process of do the analysis first and then start looking at the technology, then talk to a lot of these vendors and then say, okay, here's our remote collaboration setting, and then which one of you can actually meet that requirement, right? So. Awesome, thank you for that detailed uh, detailed answer. Um, so the communication is, is very important, so not to forget that, right? Yeah. Um, all right, uh, lastly, uh, can you give us some examples of utilities that you've seen who are already doing workforce modernization? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So from, my personal experience, right? Of course, uh, San Diego Gas and Electric here at OverIT has been doing a lot uh, with that offline GIS innovations around the GIS packets. So really modernizing the uh, areas and modernizing the experience around the 
um, GIS experience uh, for the field workers. So segmenting it in the right way, how the information gets communicated in real time and online, offline. So that so San Diego Gas and Electric is definitely one of the example of achieving that field workforce modernization from GIS perspective. From AR and VR, uh, I've technically, I've personally seen more innovation happening in Europe. Uh, I think you know there's a lot of um, already trainings and enablement based um, systems uh, or uh, organizations out there. So uh, like organizations, organizations like Enel, which is you know mostly based in Europe, but they're actually a global utility. Uh, they have actually implemented that whole idea of virtual reality based training. So utilizing things like HoloLens and then put their workers in a global setting uh, and then into a single training session, right? So instead of a trainer having to travel all around the world for them to be able to train with the uh, same procedures and same uh, corporate technologies, but rather they get into these virtual settings together, no matter where the employees may be based on, and then have the enablement in the virtual reality setting. Uh, it was almost out of necessity for them because they were just so global that they really needed that virtual environment to put everybody in. But you know, just for local training, they've proven to be uh, very effective and then cost saving too. That, like we talked about, uh, they could mimic and simulate a cost, very costly scenarios like uh, you know hazard or high risk activity uh, into a virtual reality settings, uh, allowing their field technicians to be more familiar to be more familiar. Uh, with that idea. So those are the two examples top of my uh, head, but you know, feel free to reach out to uh, you know, over IT and then we, we'll be able to uh, share more answers like that, uh, more use cases uh, that uh, the questioner uh, may be looking for. That's awesome, thank you. Uh, anybody in Canada at all yet or um, that, that over at ITs we're currently working with? Or? Uh, so in Canada, currently we are talking to a few um, uh, utilities. Actually, I, I've seen from the list, uh, attendee list, that like one of the uh, um, you know can Canadian utility that we're actually set to have a meeting uh, in a few weeks uh, is attending. So hello, if you if you recognize my face. Uh, but yeah, we are currently in the process of working uh, in various North American utilities, uh, including Canada uh, and U.S. and a few in uh, Latin America as well too. Awesome. That's that's great that uh, the solutions are expanding there. So um, I don't see any more questions in our uh, questions section uh, at the moment. So we can uh, we can start to transition to the end here. Uh, if you have any questions um, to the audience, uh, feel free to reach out to Elliot. The email is on the screen there. And uh, if you need anything from Electricity Canada, feel free to reach out to myself. Uh, my name again is Farhan Mirza. Uh, Elliot, I think that would, will bring us to the conclusion of today's session. So thank you so much to Over IT uh, for talking to us today, as well as Elliot uh, for taking the time. Uh, to our audience, thank you for attending. Uh, before we end today's session, please mark your calendars for our upcoming webinars. Um, in September, we have Oracle doing a two-part session on Thursday, September 21st. Uh, the first part is going to be uh, accelerating electrification and scaling demand flexibility through customer action. And then part two of that webinar set series will be on September 28th, why DERMs must span both sides of the meter. So uh, those webinars are coming up uh, in September. Any of our future sessions that we uh, book will be placed on our uh, website under the event section, uh, and they will be shared on Current Affairs, which is our newsletter, which goes out every month. Uh, so please keep an eye on those. In closing, thanks again to Over IT and Elliot and to our audience for taking the time to attend today. We look forward to seeing you again. Until then, stay safe and see you next time. Bye for now.